What's up everybody? In today's video, we are going to cover 50 high yield rapid review questions for your surgery EOR. These are the questions straight from the NCCPA blueprint and these are the questions that I study for my EORs that significantly help me with my scores. So let's begin. First question, what electrolyte must you check preoperatively if a patient is on hemodialysis? And that would be potassium. So they're going to give you a stem, and they're going to tell you the patient is in hemodialysis. They're going to tell you which of these electrolytes should be checked prior to undergoing surgery. They'll give you several different options, and the answer is K, potassium. What lab tests must all women of childbearing age have before they undergo surgery? So the obvious choice is beta ACG for pregnancy, but we should also check CBC because possibility of anemia from menses. Number three, if a patient is taking insulin, should the patient take it on the day of the surgery? So they can give you different uh, answers, uh, and the correct answer is no. They should only take half of the long-acting insulin, such as Lenti, and they should be started on D5 NSIV, and we should check their glucose preoperatively, operatively, and postoperatively. So the answer is no, only the half of the daily dose, and we should start them on D5 NS. What is the chart course triad? Uh, one of the things that you guys should be really focusing on during your studies is know all the triads, know all the syndromes, because they're easily to make questions around. So knowing this high yield stuff will significantly improve your scores. So the chart course triad is fever, jundice, and the right upper quadrant pain. And this is seen with cholangitis. So they're going to tell you the patient comes in, the patient's really jaundiced, they're going to have fever, and they're going to complain with the right upper quadrant pain. That should make you think of cholangitis, and that is called Charcot's triad. Question number five. What's coolant sign? The coolant sign is a bluish discoloration of the peri-umbilical area due to the retroperitoneal hemorrhage tracking around the anterior abdominal wall through the facial planes. So this is acute hemorrhagic pancreatitis, an example. So you can see on a picture, the coolant sign is the periumbilical, and the Turner side is going to have the bruising on the side. And the way I remember this, to differentiate the two, is Turner's, there's the word turn in it, so turn meaning turn to the side, so side bruising, Turner's, and the periumbilical is coolant sign. Question number six, pheochromocytoma symptoms triad. So when it comes to pheochromocytoma, just remember the first three letters of the pheochromocytoma, P-H-E. Those are the symptoms, palpitations, headaches, and episodic diaphoresis. Number seven, what's Virchow's node? And Virchow node, it is metastatic tumor to the left supraclavicular node. So in a stem, they're going to tell you during physical exam, you found this node in a left supraclavicular region, and this is going to be asking you what is this most likely significant for, and the answer is uh, virtual nodes commonly seen in which cancer? It's a gastric cancer. So gastric cancer, virtual node, left supraclavicular area. Question number nine. What is Boerhaave syndrome? Boerhaave syndrome is esophageal perforation. So the question may state that patient comes in, reported of drinking, uh, vomiting, so forth, making you think it's a Valerie Meister, but if the esophageal perforation is mentioned, that is a Boerhaave syndrome, and this can lead to the sepsis. What is Bud Chiari syndrome? See, there's so many different syndromes that they can ask you questions about. So the Bud Chiari syndrome is thrombosis of hepatic vein. They can also give you a stem with a different blood vessels, and they're gonna ask you which one of these vessels is associated with the Bud Chiari syndrome, and that would be hepatic veins. Number 11, what is Cushing syndrome? Cushing, Cushing syndrome is excessive cortisol production. So they're going to give you a stem, they're going to say lack of cortisol, too much cortisol, they can include other different hormones and so forth, but too much cortisol production, it is Cushing's syndrome. Alright guys, so all these books, in this book you're going to find over 3,800 questions just like this, 
These are all the questions from the NCCPA blueprint. They follow every subject, and these are all super high yield. Uh, you can scan the code. The book is only 20 bucks on Amazon. It will significantly help you with your uh, scores. And for those of you that are new to my channel, please take a look around. This is uh, one of the last ones on the EOR by end of the week. I plan to have all of the EOR high yield 50 questions for every EOR, for every class in didactic here. If you haven't subscribed yet, please hit that button, help me grow this channel, give that thumbs up, leave a comment, tell me what you think about these questions. It significantly helps the channel and I truly, truly appreciate you guys. So let's continue. Question number 12. What is Mirazi's syndrome? Again, you can see so many syndromes within a surgery, so many possible questions that can be created around it. And Mirazi's syndrome is extrinsic obstruction of the common hepatic bile duct from the gallstones and gallbladder or a cystic duct. So if you see common hepatic duct being obstructed, that is associated with Mirazi's syndrome. What is red reaction syndrome? And I hope you guys like all these little pictures that I put in the behind because they sometimes can associate you with the answers. And sometimes if you're a visual learner, remembering a picture can also help you remember the answer. So red reaction syndrome is a syndrome of the rapid vancomycin infusion resulting in a skin erythema. So they're going to tell you you had a post-operative patient in the ICU. Uh, they were found to have some stuff in their blood cultures. They were started on vancomycin. And soon after starting the vancomycin, patient turned completely like red. So that is red reaction syndrome, vancomycin infusion. What is the repeating syndrome? What do electrolytes look like? So they're going to give you a stem. They may tell you this is a patient that was malnourished, uh, lost, haven't eaten anything, and you worry about refeeding syndrome, and if electrolytes show hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypophosphatemia, this is associated with refeeding a starving patient. And another remember thing, way for me was that I remember that all three electrolytes were down. Hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypophosphatemia. All three down, refeeding syndrome. For non-cardiac patient for surgery, the ejection fracture must be. So they're going to give you echo results with the different ejection fractures, uh, not fractures, ejection fractions. And to go under the surgery, to undergo anesthesia for non-cardiac patients, the surgery must have ejection fraction greater than 35%. Anything less than 35%, anesthesia may hold the surgery. Number 16, which metabolic risk is an absolute contraindication for surgery? And that would be diabetic coma. A patient in diabetic coma cannot undergo surgery. MI patients shouldn't have any surgery for how long after the MI? They're going to tell you patient comes in, uh, they had recent MI, and they're going to tell you different time frames for how long the patient has to wait before they can undergo the surgery and the answer is six months. So you can see how they can play with the different times. They can tell you three months, six months, four weeks, one year. The answer is six months. MI, six months surgery. 18. The most common cause of fever day one to three postoperatively is. So known different uh, days when a fever can occur post-operatively is really important because there are several questions that you can encounter with the fever-related uh, time frames. And one to three day post-op will be pneumonia, wind. You can see the wind turbines in the in background picture. Patient is unable to take a deep breath due to the pain. Next best test is to order is chest x-ray. So if the patient goes under surgery and one to three days after the surgery, they develop fever, you should be thinking wind. First three days is wind, that's pneumonia, and get a chest x-ray. 19. Incentive spirometry prevents what? And that would be atelectasis, but not pneumonia. So the stem could be incentive spirometry is valued in a post-operative care in order to prevent they're going to give it four different choices, and incentive spirometry prevents atelectasis, or they can say which one of these is not preventable by spirometry, and answer is pneumonia. What do you order for Cody? 
So community acquire UTI. Um, I think that's what it stands for. Uh, what do you order for Kaudi? Uh, number one is to remove Foley and then UA and cultures. Most common bug is E. coli. So Kaudi is something that patients develop during the stay in a hospital. Uh, I think if the Foley stays in place more than three days, the patient is at increased risk for Kaudi. So you're gonna first remove the Foley, then you're gonna get urine analysis and cultures and they may even ask you what's the most common bug causing this, and that would be E. coli. Urine will be cloudy. Get that catheter as early out as possible. It is the next best step. So the other question they can ask is, you found a patient has Cody, and what is the next best step in treatment of this patient? And that is to the removement of the Foley, Foley catheter there is. How do we treat Cody? And that would be ciprofloxacin. Which country gets the most Cody? Cyprus. So with Cipro, ciprofloxacin, I always, another way to remember uh, information, because you've gotten so many tests, so many information is thrown at you. There's like, that's why they say in a PA school, you're like drinking out of that fountain. So Cody, for me, was always associated with Cyprus. Cyprus, like Cipro, Cyprus. And I would just say, when you're talking about Cody, a UTI, which country has the most Cody? This is not fact. I just imagined this. So I always think that whenever there's a Cody and so many UTIs, I just think of country of Cyprus. And I know the ciprofloxacin is the answer. If this is confusing, please forget it. But if this helps, create your own mnemonics, create your own little stories, because these are the things that I still remember three years after graduating. So Cyprus, Cipro, Cody. Fever on a day five, walking. This will be DVT. So you can see a patient walking. Uh, they develop a fever on a day five. So remember day one to three, it's wind, pneumonia. On a day five, it will be DVT. And they're gonna have a unilateral swelling and edema. Which score do we use for DVT? So they're going to tell you patient has a fever on day 5. They may not even tell you that it's a DVT, but they may ask you which score will be most indicative of this uh, diagnosis, and the answer is VELS score. VELS score, DVT, fever, day 5. If VELS score is greater than 4, you should order duplex ultrasound. So duplex ultrasound will be done bedside in the ICU or as an inpatient and it will show a DVT. Post-op day 7 fever. So you see guys there's different days when a fever can develop post-operatively. This is easy to make questions around. So differentiating between different days and knowing what happens on those it will significantly improve your scores. A fever on a day 7 would mean a wound infection likely cellulitis or a surgical site infection, which is the most common type of nosocomial infection in surgical patients. Days one to three, pneumonia. Day five, DVT. Day seven, wound infection. Post-op day 10 fever, after and pelvic surgery, deep wound infection or abscess. So if it's day 10, you should be thinking about deep wound infection. So you can see how they can give you different answers. They can be saying what's the most common cause of post-op 10-day fever. They can say pneumonia. They can say DVT. They can say surgical site infection. They can say deep wound infection. And the answer is deep wound on a day 10 or abscess. Post-op fever day 10, you should be ordering a CT of abdomen and pelvis if they had abdominal surgery. So the CT, because remember on day 10, it's a deep wound infection or an abscess, and sometimes that's really hard to see on x-ray, so you should be ordering a CT to look for a soft tissue infection and abscess. If an abscess is found on a CT, you should order CT-guided drainage, percutaneous, and then treat with the IV, Cipro, and Metro. So they're going to ask you, what is the best treatment for this patient after you found the abscess? And the answer is drainage. And treatment with IV antibiotics, Cipro, and metronidazole. Cipro sounds again like a Cyprus country. In a Cyprus, they treat abdominal abscess in the metro. So that's how I remembered it. 
Once again, anything to do with the UTI, I think about Cipro, Cyprus country, and I say in the Cyprus, where do they treat abdominal abscess? And they treat it in their local metro. So Cipro, metro, CT drainage of the abdominal abscess. Malignant hyperthermia is what? So malignant hyperthermia is seen shortly after the anesthetic is given. So 30 to 45 minutes, fever temp over 104, where in post-op fever range is 101 to 103. So if you see a stem, and when they talk about you giving a patient anesthetic during the surgery, and they spike a fever right away, like 30 to 45 minutes after it's been given, and the temp is really high, like 104 or higher, that should make you think of malignant hyperthermia. Most common cause of post-op fever day one is atelectasis, you should get a chest x-ray, improve ventilation, give spirometry, and if needed, bronchoscopy, because bronchoscopy is really invasive. So once again, you can see different days. Day one, atelectasis. Day two and three is pneumonia. Day five, DVT. Day seven, surgical side infection. Day 10, deep wound abscess. All patients with dyspepsia should be tested for what? And they all should be tested for H. pylori. So they're going to give you a stem. They're going to say all the patients with these diagnoses, X, Y, Z, should be tested for H. pylori. In that case, answer is dyspepsia, or they can do vice versa. Tell you this is a patient dealing with dyspepsia, and we should be testing them for H. pylori. What is the most common cause of non-GI nausea in vomiting? So that would be a titus media. So titus media... Uh, infection in the ear can cause patients to have nausea and vomiting, and this is not associated with the GI, so this is an easy question to make because they can give you three other irrelevant diagnoses that could make you pick a wrong answer, but if you know the tightest media, ear infection causes patients to have nausea and vomiting, and this is non-GI related. What level of bilirubin will cause jundice? So they're going to give you a stem with different bilirubin levels, and they're going to say at what level would patient experience jundice, and that would be greater than 3. Bilirubin is a byproduct of heme metabolism. So greater than 3 causes jundice. Most common cause of recurrent jundice. So they're going to tell you a patient has 3 episodes of jundice in the last year, and they're going to ask you which one of these is the most common cause, and that would be Gilbert syndrome. So the way I remember this is poor Gil, Gilbert, just imagine a dude named Gil. Uh, poor Gil gets so many episodes of jaundice, and you just got to ask yourself if they're asking a recurrent jaundice, who gets so many jaundices, and you're going to answer poor Gil, Gilbert syndrome. Gilbert syndrome deals with which bilirubin? And that would be unconjugated bilirubin. Poor Gil, unconjugated bilirubin. Again, guys, if you like these questions, please do check out a book. It's on Amazon. Hit that subscribe button. Help me grow this channel. Help me spread the word. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think about these answers. Let me know what you think about the whole thing. I would truly appreciate that. Thank you very much. Let's continue. Painless jaundice with weight loss should make you think of what? They're going to give you a stem. Patient has jaundice. They're going to report some weight loss. And they're going to ask you which one of these is the most likely to cause. And you should be getting a CT of the abdomen to rule out pancreatic cancer. So with painless jaundice and reported weight loss, you should be thinking of pancreatic cancer. Most common cause of upper GI bleed, and that would be peptic ulcer disease. Upper GI bleed, peptic ulcer disease. History of cirrhosis and portal hypertension should make you think of what? And that would be esophageal varices. They can going to give you different answers, uh, very similar in location, uh, somewhat similar in presentation. But if patient has history of cirrhosis and a portal hypertension, answer is esophageal varices. History of repeated vomiting or retching. So history of repeated vomiting and retching is malarivized here. Uh, they're going to tell your patient when 
out last night, they were drinking profusely, they got home, they were retching, vomiting, and so forth, they got some blood in their sputum, and that should make you think of Mallory White's tear. Most common cause of peptic ulcer disease is H. pylori. H. pylori, peptic ulcer disease, most common cause of upper GI bleed, also peptic ulcer disease. What are the side effects of Pepto-Bismol? So this is another thing that you guys should pay attention to. These are the questions that are easily pipped during your rotation. What are the side effects of medications? What's the next best step? So all these questions, not only will they help you with your EOR, but if you are witnessing pimping during your rounds, which is really common in inpatient uh, setting, you will significantly uh, improve your presentation if you know these questions when asked, and it will look really good on you as a student. So side effects of Pepto-Bismol are dark colored tongue and stool. Or they can tell you the patient comes in and postoperatively or preoperatively and they reported that they got really dark colored stool. You do a physical exam, you see a dark colored tongue, and they're going to ask you which of these medications is most likely the cause of this. And the answer is Pepto-Bismol. Norovirus is most common cause of what? Norovirus is the most common cause of gastroenteritis in adults in the USA. So the way I remember this, I think of the cruise ships, hospitals, restaurants. So norovirus, gastroenteritis. Most common cause of diarrhea in children, not adults. So always pay attention to what population they're talking about because different diseases present themselves differently with different ages. So the most common cause of diarrhea in children is rotavirus. So rotavirus, diarrhea, kids. Non-invasive enterotoxin infectious diarrhea is, so non-invasive means vomiting, watery, a lot of it, no fecal white blood cells, or blood seen in it. If it had blood, that would be dysentery. So non-invasive infectious diarrhea, no blood in it, watery, a lot of diarrhea. Which bug can cause diarrhea after consuming the fried rice? So they're going to tell you patient comes in, they were at the restaurant eating some food containing fried rice, and they're going to tell your patient's got this diarrhea and ask you what is the most common bug associated with this, and the answer is Bacillus cirrus. Bacillus cirrus, and the way I remember this, is bed fried rice cereal causes diarrhea. So, you know, like they make the cereal out of the rice, and I would just say a patient had a fried rice, I would always associate that with a cereal. And cereus sounds like cereal, and bacillus kind of sounds like bad. Bad cereal fried rice causes diarrhea. Rice water stools, severe dehydration, should make you think of Vibrio cholera. With the rice watery stools, Vibrio cholera. Most common cause of traveler's diarrhea, that would be E. coli. E. coli travels a lot. Who travels a lot? E. coli does. So E. coli, with a lot of traveling, most common cause of traveler's diarrhea. 48. What are the symptoms of E. coli? This would be the abrupt onset of watery diarrhea. You may experience cramps and vomiting. So you're going to tell your patient was traveling, eating some food in the airport, on ships, whatever, different country. Uh, they ate something and they just instantly just got this like watery diarrhea. They may have some cramps and some vomiting. They're going to ask you what's the most common cause and answer is E. coli for travelers diarrhea. Which medication is the most common cause of C. diff? So they're going to tell you patient had several boats of diarrhea in an ICU or in inpatient settings, and they're going to give you different medications that a patient is on, and they're going to ask you which one of these is the most common culprit, and the answer is clindamycin. And the way I remember this, clinda, Linda, clinda, sounds like Linda, Linda gets C. diff. Linda gets a lot of C. diff. So who gets a lot of C. diff? Linda. Who gets a lot of recurring jundice? Poor Gil. Gilbert gets the jundice. Linda gets C. diff. And question number 50. Campylobacter enteritis is contracted from what? So Campylobacter enteritis is contracted from poultry, turkey. And the way I remember this one, at that camp, Campylobacter camp, 
That's the only thing I remember about it from that war. So it was camp, Campylobacter enteritis, poultry, turkey. They eat a lot of turkey at that camp where people get sick. So what do people eat when they get sick camping? Turkey. Campylobacter, turkey. All right, guys, so that brings us to the end. Thank you very much. Congrats. You guys are almost done with the PA school. This is an amazing career. Please check out all other videos. There's 50 questions for every EOR, 50 questions for every class in didactic here. All of these questions combined, you may experience and see during your PANS prep, and you may see them during your PANS exam. So best of luck to you. Hit that subscribe button. Help me grow this channel, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care. Bye.